everyone, welcome to our next lecture on animals. Guys, we're finally starting animals. It's gonna be so great. Okay, so we're gonna be focusing on these different phylums. Remember I told you in the last couple lectures that taxonomy is really important. Okay, I'm gonna give you guys the taxonomy in this lecture, which is the PowerPoint that you have at home. Uh, and I will probably provide you an actual master taxonomy list, but again, you guys already have it. So just make sure that as you guys are going through and studying, that you're considering the taxonomy. What I always did when I was a student is I wrote out all the taxonomy and then I'd make little notes next to each one. Like what made the classes different from each other? What makes the phylums different from each other? Create this, you know, little study guides for yourself and trust me, it will help out. All right, without further ado, guys, let's get started. I'm talking about our first phylum today, phylum periphera. But first, before we do that, we actually have to talk about what is an animal. So I just defined, we're talking about animals. This is now marine animals, all the marine animal organisms in the ocean. But what does that mean to be an animal? Let's talk about that. All right, so going into our first one, guys, this is marine actual organisms. So no more water talk. We're gonna be focusing on animals pretty much for the rest of the semester, besides when we get to ecosystems, which is gonna be equally cool, so you're gonna love it. All right, so we're talking about animals. Animals, you think of when you, you guys think you know animals, you're like, oh, I know what an animal is. It's that thing that's running around my yard. Yes and no, okay? So there are characteristics that all animals have, but not all animals look alike. We're gonna learn about lots of different things that look like plants, right? They're not moving, they're not running around, but they are animals. So let's define what animals are before we get ahead of ourselves and start, you know, talking about what it means to be an animal. All right, so all animals have these four characteristics. One, they are all multicellular, okay? You can't have a unicellular animal. Yes, you can have unicellular organisms. We've already learned about some of those. Unicellular organisms like the cyanobacteria, right? All of those are gonna be unicellular, just a single cell. But when we're talking about animals, they're all going to be multicellular. I mean, think about us, like we're big and we walk around. You can't do that if you're unicellular. So again, you have to be multicellular to be this big and complicated. Uh, next up, they are all eukaryotic, right? We're not talking about the prokaryotes, right? The bacteria, we're not talking about the archaeans, right? Those extremophiles, we're talking about eukaryotic organisms, okay? So again, under the domain eukarya has things like funguses and plants and animals, but we're just gonna be talking about the kingdom Animalia, okay? So that's what we're gonna be focusing on. Um, next up, all animals are heterotrophic. There is no animals out there that do photosynthesis. They cannot produce their own nutrients. Asterisk. There is one organism that can actually eat enough photosynthetic organisms that he can kind of do a little photosynthesis if he needs to. But for the most part, and when he's growing, he can't do that. Um, for the most part, all animals are heterotrophic. They must consume nutrients to actually get their energy, right? They are not autotrophs. They can't make their own. They actually have to consume their nutrients. Uh, next up, all animals are motile, meaning they can move at some point in their life. Remember the sponge, well, not remember, we haven't learned about the sponge yet, but the sponge that we're going to learn about is completely stationary forever, for always, except when he is a larval. Right, when he's in his larval stage or a larvae. Okay, so when they're in their larval stage, they are, they're motile, meaning they're floating around, they're doing this little kind of swim thing, and that's really useful, we, like we learned about broadcast spawners, to send out your gametes to where they need to go, and then they can settle somewhere else, far away from you, so you don't accidentally reproduce with your offspring, ah. Okay, so, again, motile at some point in their life. Now, a lot of organisms are motile their whole lives, like us, right, we are an animal, I and mean, we are motile pretty much our whole lives. Even when we're babies, we're all wiggling around or moving around. Even in Euro, we're moving around. Um, but not all organisms can move around their entire life, but they can move around at some point in their life. So maybe you are sedentary when you're a baby and then you move around as an adult or vice versa. You're movable, uh, movable motile when you're a baby, but then you're sedentary or stuck, still not moving when you're an adult. So either, again, at some point in your life, you are moving around if you are an animal. All right, so we're gonna be talking about two different types of animals. The first half of this big, long series of lectures on phylums is gonna be on what we call the invertebrates, or the inverts, for short. Okay, invertebrates mean they do not have a vertebrae. So our vertebrae is our backbone, right? Um, what makes the bottom of our little vertebrae, that is our whole spinal cord kind of thing. Um, Organisms are classified into whether you have them or whether you don't. So the first half of the semester um, is all going to be, and I think up to test two, 
look on your syllabus, double check with me. I think on test two, that's all going to be for invertebrates. Okay, so we're gonna be working from our sponges essentially all the way up to, I think he kind of dramatized the last one we covered, but look at the syllabus, make sure to double check the dates and all that. So that's gonna be the next test. It's gonna be focusing on all of the invertebrates. Then we're gonna focus the second half of this whole phylum uh, lecture series on the vertebrates, okay? So the with backbone. These are pretty much all the organisms that you probably think of. Dolphins, whales, fishes, sharks, stuff like that. And so there, I will tell you there's a lot more invertebrates than there are vertebrates. So make sure that you guys study, study, study these invertebrates. Because you know what a dolphin looks like. You know what a penguin looks like. Right? I know we're going to learn more facts about them, which is really going to be cool, but you guys probably have no idea what a tinafore is or a ketonet. But you will once we're done with this lecture series, so um, keep that in mind. Now, like I said, there's a lot more invertebrates than there are vertebrates, so make sure that when we're doing the bulk of these, especially when it comes to your practicals, guys, probably going to be a lot of these invertebrates. So these are foreign things a lot of the time, so make sure that you really, really put the time in to study those. I mean, put the time in to study everything, but specifically the invertebrates. Okay, um, let's talk body plans. We've kind of already mentioned this, but I would just want to rehash this because a lot of the times, especially when it comes to your practicals, I'm going to give you a mystery organism and you're going to have to figure out what it is. So essentially, I could just give you a random organism that you've never seen before and, and you'd have to figure out what phylum it goes into. So if you look at the first thing you should look at is body plan. Okay, body plan should be first because a lot of these organisms either are bilateral, meaning like us, we have two sides, bilateral, bi meaning two sides, lateral meaning sides. So you cross right down the middle, we are a mirror image of each other. Okay, but a, um, a couple of these groups are going to be radially symmetry, symmetrical. What, think of like a circle, right? You can cut that in many different directions and it's still a mirror image, it's just a circle. Okay, so if you look at something and it has radial symmetry, you know, right off the bat, you nixed off all of those other phylums. It can only be a handful of phylums now. Okay, if it's bilateral, it's a little bit more tricky. There's more of those organisms. But again, you can knock, start knocking all of those ones off your list. So when you're thinking about it, you're like, is it Cnidaria? Is it Echinodermata? And then you're like, it's radial. Oh, it's got to be Echinodermata. Pentaradial. But still, so make sure that you guys pay attention to that stuff too. I know in class we would actually be doing this, but since we're not, we're going to do the best that we can and, um, you know, still study these organisms in their body plans. All right, so radial sim radially symmetrical. This is equal parts that radiate out. So think of something round, like a sea urchin, right? That's radial. Equal parts going out of every single center. Um, bilateral, again, is us. So that's two sides, two mirror images. Uh, now, some of them, one of them, are going to be asymmetrical or non-symmetrical or irregular. This pretty much just applies to one group, and that's going to be the sponges, our first group. These guys don't have perfect symmetry. They're not a circle, and you can't cut them in half and get a mirror image. They're kind of wonky. They're just kind of wobbly, and therefore that would be considered irregular or asymmetrical. Okay, so again, we have the sponge right here. This would be the non-symmetrical or asymmetrical one. We have the radial symmetry. Even though these tentacles are hanging out, and you look at it, and you're kind of like, it doesn't really look like a circle. If you look at its base, right, its base is a column, right? It's like a, it's like a tube. Um, and then finally, we have something like an arthropod, which would be bilateral. So you can only cut it down one side to get the actual. Now, this one, sometimes our students argue, yes, you can cut it down the middle to make both sides. But you could also cut it the middle and the side and the side and the side and the other side and the other side, and you still get it. So that's hence that radial symmetry, radiating outwards. All right, guys, that takes us to the first of the phylums, phylum periphera, the sponges. Yes, you guys will need to know that this is a phylum periphera, not just periphera, because I could ask you, what is periphera? Is it a class? Is it a family? Is it an order? Is it a species? Is it a genus? Is it a domain? Is it a kingdom? It's a phylum, so make sure when you guys are learning that. That was actually something that I struggled with when I was an undergrad. I just learned, like, periphera, calcarea, I would start learning the taxonomy in order, which was correct, but I didn't know if it was a class or an order, because I never said phylum periphera, class calcarea. You know, so make sure when you guys are studying that you do that, because this will be on your test. All right, so with that said, let's get to the phylum periphera. The sponges. So the phylum, all right, let's start at the beginning, because this is the first one, so I do want you guys to get this from the beginning. Remember, we are in the domain eukarya. That's the biggest group, right? We are in the kingdom animalia because we're talking about animals. 
All right now we are in the phylum periphera and there are three classes in the phylum periphera that we're going to learn about and that you will be responsible for. The first class, Hexantilinidae. Yes, it is kind of hard to say. Yes, it's even harder to spell. Do you need to know it? Yes, you do. I know it's digital and it's kind of hard and how am I going to test you, but trust me, learn it as best as you can. Um, and it's fun to say, Hexantilinidae. Imagine if you got that in Scrabble. Like a game-winning word right there. All right, the next class is Demospongia. This is the bass sponges. So hexanatilinidae is the glass sponges. Um, excuse me. Demospongia is the bath sponges. Okay, so you can think of like when you wash yourself with a sponge. Yeah, those sponges were actually designed by real sponges. And a lot of them still are real sponges. You get those bath sponges. It's actually just, you know, a former living organism. All right. Uh, and finally, the class calcarea. This is your encrusting rock sponges. If you go to the inner title here and you see something that's kind of encrusting and growing on the rock, it's probably a rock sponge. So you're like, I didn't even know we had sponges out here. We do. All right. This is another really important part of these phylums that we're going to be talking about is the characteristics. I will always give you the characteristics for that phylum. So if on a test I ask you, what are the key characteristics for the phylum. When I talk about key characteristics, I mean, what are the characteristics that separate that phylum from every other phylum? Okay. So in this case, the name porifera means pore bearing, meaning that these guys are covered in pores. So if you look at their body, they have tiny holes all over their body. Okay. So if I were to give you a mystery organism and you look at it and it's covered in tiny holes, pretty much right off the bat with asymmetry, Asymmetry and full of holes, boom, you got yourself a sponge right there. Now, these are these tiny little holes on the outside right here are called ostia or ostia. I'm sorry, <laughs> or ostia. They're just ostia. Um, this big one up here is called the osculum. So it's all it's either the ostia, the little ones on the side, or the big one is the osculum. Okay, so I could put a picture on your practical and I could say, what is this big opening right here? Or what are these small openings? Or what are they used for? Okay, so these openings essentially are used to draw water in and bathe the cells. These guys are very simple. They are the first animal. In fact, I'm going to show you guys a video. It's the origin of, of life on the planet. It goes through each one of the phylums in great details and the animations are just amazing. So yes, it is 100% required material that you watch this video and it will provide the link for you guys at the end. Um, sponges are so much cooler than you guys thought. Trust me. I know you're gonna be like, no, they're not. Wait till you watch this video. Super cool. Okay. So these ostia and osculum are tiny holes that basically line the outside outer body part of the, the sponge. And what they're going to do is they're, the whole body is covered in what's called coanocytes. So that's another one. Um, I think it's on my next slide. But they're these tiny little collar cells. And essentially what they do is they beat their little flagella. So all the cells are aligning here, kind of beating their little flagella, creating a water current. That water current brings water through the ostia and eventually up and out the osculum. When they're doing that, they're filtering out the water. So these guys are filter feeders. So that's how they feed. They don't have a mouth. They don't have teeth. They're not grabbing at their prey. They're literally sucking in the water, keeping the food, and getting rid of the rest of the water. Um, so these guys are amazing, amazing filter um, filtration systems for the ocean. It's Sponges are super crucial. Anyway, um, cool thing about these guys is even though they have cells, they don't actually have tissues. Now, tissues are a group of specialized cells working together in a similar function. So it's very close to like our tissue, but it's not quite the same. So they are considered an animal without true tissue. In fact, they are the only animal without a true tissue. Okay, so again, key characteristics for the phylum periphera. One, asymmetry. Two, um, what do we have? Two, no true tissues. Three, they have coanocytes. Four, uh, they have ostia, they have osculum, they're pore bearers. I mean, all of these things are, again, these are just kind of like bullet points that you could give me if I asked you what are the key characteristics for these phylums. Um, and again, everybody else has true tissues. Everybody else has some kind of regular symmetry. Um, nobody else has ostia or osculum. So again, all these characteristics are known as key characteristics because they separate out this organism 
from any other organism, this phylum from any other phylum. All right. Um, now, we did talk about sponges already, how they adults are sessile or stuck in place, right? Not moving. But the juveniles, the larvae, are motile. So if you look at this and you're like, that can't be, a pl it can't be an animal because it's not moving around. It can because it only moves around when it's a larvae. Once it settles, it settles there for good and is stuck there forever. They also have what's called coanocytes, okay? Coanocytes or collar cells. These essentially are round little cells with these little like almost popped up collars, right? So that's what it kind of looks like. Uh, and those collars are used to help catch food particles and bring them to the, to the rest of the cells. Now, um, the flagella that, that I already mentioned, right? That's the thing that actually beats really fast back and forth, creates that water current. That water current then sucks the water through the ostia and then up out of the oscula. So this is kind of how they um, they actually filter their water, and we're going to see this in the video that we talk that we watch right after this. Uh, and again, it really shows you a 3D like imaging of this the detail. It's just fantastic. Um, so I really highly recommend it. I do normally I would show you guys this in class, and I try to put it in the videos, um, but the BBC doesn't like me using clips of their stuff and putting it in my videos. They're like. Well, you, know, you can't make money off this then. I'm like, I'm not trying to make money off this. I'm trying to teach my class. What I don't want to, what do you want me to do? Anyway. Okay. Um, what else? They, we talked about coanocytes. They also have porocytes. Again, porocytes, it's essentially a little cell that creates this, this little pore that allows water to pass through, um, allowing again the exposure to these coanocytes so that they can kind of pick it apart and find that food particles from the water, filtering out the food particles from the water. Um, they can reproduce both sexually and asexually. So there's two forms. The asexual form is essentially where they bud. So imagine I grew a little tiny me right here, and then when it was big enough, it just pops off and goes, hi, bye me. Really creepy, but if you're a sponge, it totally doesn't matter. You can do that. That's the asexual form. If you, you are um, going to reproduce sexually, that means you actually have to have sperm and eggs. And in their case, they are hermaphrodites. They have both sperm and eggs at the same time. So what they'll do is they'll wait for, remember we talked about the triggers of the moon and the tides and the water and just so the conditions are just right. And then eventually they will release their gametes, the sperm and eggs, out into the water when, when all the other sponges are doing it too. Now how they communicate this, we still don't really know. It has something to do with the environmental factors like the temperature and the moon phases and the tides because essentially you're sitting there and you're waiting, 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 and then every one of them just goes and starts opening up and doing it. It's crazy. We're also going to see that in the video, and it's super cool. It essentially just looks like little clouds and little... But it's actually lots of sperm and eggs. Yes, for the fertilization. Broadcast spawning. Very important, especially if you're a sponge and you can't move. You don't want to reproduce with yourself the whole time. You want to reproduce with other people, hence broadcast spawning. All right, let's talk structure. Now, we talked about how sponges aren't made up of true tissue, so what are they made up of? In this case, they're made up of lots of different things, but one of them that is really used for support are these spicules right here. Now, this is a close-up of different types of spicules, and you can see they're all sorts of different shapes. In fact, some of them kind of look like um, crazy types of tools, like that one's almost a pitchfork that looks like a jack. Um, this one looks like some kind of mushroom attached to another mushroom. Um, this one looks like a throwing star. I mean, it's crazy how specific these type of spicules are. And a lot of times species specific, so you can tell this type of um, sponge it is just by the shape of the spicules, which is really cool. Now, these spicules are made of calcium carbonate, and they're used, again, as support, right? Structural support. So they're basically used to kind of hold up the different types of cells. So we're going to see that in just a second. Um, spongin, shouldn't shock you, spongin is kind of squishy, and that's, again, used for the support. So it's kind of like a support protein that is made by the sponge to kind of give it that nice girth and, and support. Otherwise, they'd be just really, really flat sponges. And so they want to build up so they can get more water access because um, that's how they feed. So that's what they want. Now, some of these different sponges that we're going to learn about have more spongin than others. So things like bath sponges, the things you've literally bathed yourself with probably, um, are going to have a lot of spongin. Some things like the glass sponges are going to have very, very little spongin or no spongin, but they're going to have a lot of spicules, hence glass, because again, these are actually kind of sharp and pokey. Um, also used for protection, so if you try to eat them, you're going to get a pokey in the face. 
All right, so let's take a uh, look inside an actual sponge. We see our big osculum right here. We see the tiny ostia on the side, so those little tiny pores or openings. If we were to do a little cross section, meaning just cut it and kind of actually look inside this non-tissue tissue, what we would see right here is this would be the little porocyte essentially, that's the ostia, well surrounding the ostia, um, allowing them, again, water to flow through. On either side of those, we're going to have things like amoebocytes. This is just helped in um, digesting food and stuff like that. Spicules used for support. And again, on the inside, these tiny little bulbous things with this little popped collar right here at the end, these are known as the coanocytes. So this little collar is actually what captures those tiny little food particles. So the flagella beats its little tail, creating a water current. These food particles get trapped here, and then they get moved up to the coanocyte. And so this is how the little guy eats. Um, here's a different type of sponge. So again, bit, numerous different shapes and sizes and colors and all this kind of stuff. Um, so you can see the ostia on the outside and these osculum. Now the osculum are still bigger than the ostia. Always are going to be bigger than the ostia, but they're still not that much bigger. So really the osculum can be ca categorized more as an outflow. So the ostia is the inflow and the osculum is the outflow. A better way to put it than the large ones and the small ones although typically you're not wrong if you say it like that um, again we have some representative little spicules right here all different types of shapes all right getting into each of the classes remember yes you do need to know that they are classes and yes you do need to know the names of all of them so hexantillinidae again good luck saying it I say it as best as I can I'm probably saying it wrong who knows it's Latin um, but this essentially is a hexa hexagonal shape um, that is kind of arranged on top of each other in kind of a rotating spiral. So it gives it this look, even though it's really hard to actually see how it's hexag hexagonal, um, but it is. So it's, it is six rayed or this hexagonal spicules and they're kind of just stacked on each other in this like rotating, I don't know, it's, we'd have to look at it under the microscope, which unfortunately we can't do. But if you want to, you can totally Google pictures of this because it's actually really cool. So that's how their spicules are arranged. Um, now this is very fragile, but hence glass sponge. It is a deep water species. So that's why it could actually be so glass and fragile because it's deep water. And as we've already learned, there's pretty much nothing happening deep water. Very few waves, uh, sorry, very little current, no waves, still waters, kind of thing like that. So they can be a little bit more fragile. Now these guys are usually kind of champagne flute, almost shaped. Um, and again, that's to kind of increase the amount of water flow that they can get going through them. So if they're long and tall, they can actually get more water flow going directly through them and allow that, um, you know, capturing that food particles to happen a little bit easier. So glass sponges, hexantillinidae, um, six-sided six spicules, uh, deep water. Those are all good characteristics to know. All right, the bath sponges. This one is probably one that you're a little bit more familiar with. Um, like I said, this is how all modern day sponges came about because there was this naturally found organism that in, in the tropics we can just harvest, use its dead body and bathe ourselves. Kind of weird that we actually bathe ourselves with someone else's carcass, but we do. I know, weird. Um, these guys are pretty much all spongin and collagen. So collagen, if, if you've ever heard of collagen, is kind of like what ladies inject into their faces to get you know, all swole up. Um, <laughs> uh, but essentially, it's, it's like a squishy protein that kind of bounces back. And so it gives people that firmness, the plumpness that they're looking for, and, you know, that they decrease in, um, when you get older. So because of all that collagen, they are squishy, squishy. So you really can just grab them and squishy, squishy them. Um, hence sponges, because they're really great at absorbing water. Weird. Um, so this is it. Again, these first couple uh, classes that we're going to be talking about are not super complicated. It's really easy to tell the difference between a glass sponge, a bath sponge, and a rock sponge. But the groups do get much harder as we go along. There's going to be lots more classes. There's going to be orders. There's going to be some families. There's a lot of taxonomy that you guys have to learn about. So if you thought marine biology was easy, it's fun. So much fun. But it's not super easy. So just keep that in mind. Study, 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 make these lists. I always write out all the taxonomy and then wrote it out again, then wrote it out again. And it does work. It just kind of gets in your head. All right. Last of the classes. All under the phylum periphera. This is now the class Calcarea, the rock sponge. We're encrusting rock sponge. 
Um, now these guys sometimes get mistaken for, did it, hmm, hang on, no, we're good, okay. These guys sometimes get mistaken for corals. Okay, so corals are cnidarians. Rock sponges are sponges. Ranked in the name. Okay, but so those are two groups that definitely get confused sometimes, so make sure that you guys make that distinction when you're studying. Now, these guys do have a skeleton made out of calcium carbonate, so that is that harder material that we have learned about. Nice, good uh, structural material. These guys are benthic and sessile. In fact, all of the sponges are going to be benthic and sessile. Um, right? Benthic means sitting on the bottom and sessile means not able to move. Okay, so all the sponges actually have that one. I'm not sure why it goes this one. Oh, this guy actually, I do know why this is on here. Because sometimes they're not, they're sessile, but they're not exactly benthic. So sometimes they are known as xenoepipelagic. Big fancy word here, another Scrabble winner. Okay, xeno, you can kind of think of it as accidentally, right? Epi means on top pelagic, right, on top of the pelagic, which we already learned about. So xenoepipelagic basically means that you're found in the upper pelagic by accident. Um, a couple of species are actually xenoepipelagic that we're going to talk about in the semester, but this is the first one. So sometimes there's a floating piece of trash or a buoy out in the middle of nowhere that actually gets one of these larvae to settle on it. The larvae does great and it survives. So even though it is sessile and usually benthic, sometimes they get all pelagic on us. Right? So you can find encrust encrusting rock sponges on um, it's like floating trash, buoys, stuff like that that are just found in the ocean. So that's what xenoepipelagic means. Fun new word. Yay. All right. That brings us to our video. Um, remember, for these couple, well, actually, for all the phylums, I'm going to have a lot of supplemental videos, some which I'm going to put into my lectures, some which I'm not able to. BBC. Um, but that does not mean it's not required material. So you are absolutely 100% required to watch this video. It was as if I would have showed it to you in class. Um, so I will have test questions on your exam about the video. So make sure that you guys watch all of them. And I know after like the fourth or fifth Shape of Life video, you're gonna be like, oh my God, really? Yeah, trust me, what, watching one of those videos is like studying for an hour in, with a reading. So just watch it, okay? Anyway, let's get to the video real quick. guys once again that video is mandatory so make sure that you watch it I really really hope that you did I even put it on the canvas site for you okay oh is that it are we done with sponges yes make sure that you guys actually pay attention to the schedules um, a lot of times these lectures are a little bit shorter so we will be doing two or three in a day um, so especially when it comes to things like Tina Fora, I think there's like six or seven slides. So obviously that's not going to be a whole lecture day. We'll combine that with a different phylum. So make sure that you guys are paying attention to the, the weekly schedule and you kind of keeping yourself on track on, oh, okay, so we covered four phylums this, this week. Let me make sure that I, I've covered all four of those phylums. So definitely check with the schedule. But uh, I will ask you this question. It's very fancy. Who dwelleth in a tropical planet beneath the ocean? That would be peripheral Robert Cubicle Trousers. Who lives in a pineapple under the sea, SpongeBob SquarePants. Come on, guys. I'm too old for this. You guys should at least have gotten that one. All right. With that said, I will thank you once again for listening to my nonsense in my kitchen. And I'm sorry I can't be there in person with you. But thanks for doing a fantastic job. You guys are killing it this semester. Just keep it up. Keep watching these videos. Keep doing your work, and um, yeah, we'll, we're going to have as great a semester as we possibly can. So I hope you guys are enjoying yourselves. Anyway, take care, and I will um, see you guys soon.